Oh my God, congratulations on the film. It's so beautiful. And I mean, I want to start at the end. It, I mean, the, well, we'll talk about the final scene in the airport <laughs> in a bit, but the, at the very end, the images that you show of adoptees being deported, mm -hmm. um, was that a driving force when you first came up with the idea of doing the film? Is that you were aware of that as an issue that you wanted to explore? Yeah, um, it's the main purpose for the film. I'm not leaving my family. I stuck him. What? I just don't understand how they can deport him. I was brought here when I was three. Can't we do something about this? I mean, listen to him, look at him, he's American. ISIS is targeting people like you, adopted or not. I've been here for over 30 years. I want people to, f to feel something and, and uh, be empathetic towards the people who are going through this. So yes, it's, a, it's uh, ap absolutely the main purpose of it. And when did you start working on it? This was, it was a pre-COVID production, um, but when did the whole uh, project come together initially? I started writing the script five years ago. You know, I had a shootable draft a year and a half after that. It's a pretty hard subject matter to get made. Um, also in terms of, uh, you know, casting. You know, they always talk about foreign sales value and all this stuff. So it's, it's not an easy film to get made. Um, so in between, I made a, an, another film, uh, Miss Purple, uh, and that also helped to kind of stoke the, the, the fire because I, at Sundance they said, uh, what are you making next? And I said, oh, I'm making this film called Blue Bayou. And it's actually, funny enough, a part of a Korean family trilogy. It's not, <laughs> but I put it out in the press like that and then I got a call being like, oh, that's funny. We didn't know we were part of a trilogy, you know? <laughs> and I was like, well, are we making the film or not? Um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 it took a second. To get it made, and did Ma when did Macro get in involved as your producers? So they're the ones that commissioned the script. So okay. from the very beginning, they've been, they, wow. they've been such wonderful partners. You know, Macro's the best, and 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 you know, of course, they care about you know stories about uh, diverse voices and 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 stories like this. Um, I'd love to hear you talk a bit about the, um, the casting, the casting process, but also, well, let's just start with uh, Jesse. I mean, she is. Absolutely incredible, and your scenes together are so beautiful and powerful. Can you talk about how you found her and what that casting process was like? Yeah, uh, I really wanted um, a, a kid that, that, that felt real, not like selling toothpaste, but like a real sort of living, breathing child that, that felt authentic. Uh, so I looked for a long time. I, I uh, looked in Tennessee, Mississippi, you know, uh, Alabama, Texas, Louisiana, uh, and it was pretty hard to find somebody that I felt um, could bring this character to life. Um, but uh, some uh, someone sent in a tape. We saw it, uh, and immediately I knew she was the one. I didn't even have to see her in real life. But uh, her and her dad drove down to New Orleans, uh, and we did a reading, and I did a bunch of improv exercises with her, and she was just fantastic. So then I... <laughs> I had drove up to Atlanta and spent a few days with her and her family. We played video games and went to the mall and <laughs> hung out and, and you know, I knew. But she's very, very special. As you can see, she's just like just a natural talent and and uh, yeah. Kids who are that that good, that young, I, I don't know where they get it from. It's funny, I found myself getting choked up in the early scenes between the two of you. I mean obviously at the end as well, but those early scenes she you have these shots of her really listening to you. Like, she's so playful, and she's like this sprite and just seems yeah. totally real. But then when she's like looking at you and taking in what you're saying, yeah. it's just like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. You mean even, yeah, especially those bayou scenes, right? Where she's just yeah. kind of listening while I'm talking. Yeah. She's great like that. Yeah. Um, and, and talk about the rest. Of the, the whole cast is fantastic. When did um, Alicia Vikander get, in, get involved? So Alicia uh, came on uh, maybe say a month and a half before um, and she you know I wrote her a letter and you know I, I had always been a huge fan of hers and and I thought the idea of having a, a um, you know person not American playing this role would be really interesting because every choice she decides to make about playing an American would be intentional and wouldn't be taken for granted so that was really interesting to me um, also, I, you know, she's so no known for all these corset dramas and, you know, she's played anything but blue collar. 
So that was also an interesting idea. But I, I there was no doubt in my mind she could, she did this movie called Pure in Sweden. It was I think her first film, and she's absolutely just raw and emotional. And, and so I, I I knew she was going to be fantastic in the role. I just you know just and I think that was part of the decision making process for her was was the fact that no one really had had presented her with this type of a, a role. And did you was there any rehearsal time? leading up pre-production or did you guys get on set and just go we talked a bit and she came early actually she came she came a few weeks early and spent time in new orleans and and uh found some people she wanted to model her accent off of and we had some time uh with sydney i had a lot of time you know i i because i i made the time and then with the guy who played uh uh q and uh, merc uh we had quite a bit of time because they're not actors Merck, the ICE agent, I found him at a GNC uh, supplement store. Uh, <laughs> he's a manager. He was a manager, and uh, I came in to buy protein powder. <laughs> and and then, put him in the movie. And I came in again, and then, you know, and then by the third time, he's like, hey, hey, brother, I know you don't need that much protein powder. What are you here for? <laughs> Uh, and and I and I was like, hey, have you ever thought about being in a movie? He's like, nope, nope, don't know what kind of movie you're making, but I don't want to be a part of it. He he thought I was trying to put him in a porno or something. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but he was fantastic, you know, and and we did uh, quite a bit of rehearsal to make that feel like because uh, I needed that sort of visceral energy of of people who are actually from that area. He's from Baton Rouge, and uh, and uh, Q is is from New Orleans, so like. That adds to the the the, the, the authentic, authentic realness uh, of the place. I think. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the the element of the story, um, the Vietnamese woman dying of cancer. Like, when did that? Was that always there in the script for you? And if you could talk about also casting that part, because the the again the interplay between the two of you was, to me, really an unexpected part of the film and just beautifully done. Yeah. Um, it was always a part of the, 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 the film from the very, very get-go. Uh, one of the reasons for that is, you know, um, you know, I mean, obviously I'm Asian-American, um, but uh, when I see Asian-American films, it's only allowed to be one thing, right? You see a film and it's just Korean, a Korean story or a Chinese story or a Vietnamese story, but... Uh, we're a lot more than just you know one entity, and we all we do talk to each other, you know. Um, so you know, I thought it was an interesting opportunity to see these two uh, Asian ethnicities, you know, kind of interact in the South. Um, and uh, you know, also it's part of the reason I said New Orleans is there's a huge enclave of of uh, Vietnamese Americans that came after the Vietnam War and were relocated to the to Texas and Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, you know, and um, she acts as sort of a, a, a mirror for Antonio. Um, you know, when you're dealing with someone who's dying, you can't really trump their issues. So it requires Antonio to get introspective and take a step back and really honestly look at take a look at his life. They're meeting each other at a time of Antonio going through a death as, Amer as an American. And uh, and Parker uh, like a physical death, so there's this kind of poetic sort of um, nature to to their relationship. I I, I just loved all those scenes. That whole storyline really really worked, and the the shot of her on the motorcycle again was like really powerful. And for me, I don't know somehow unexpectedly moving. And when her wig blows off, it's oh, this. Yeah. Incredible moment. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, that was, you know, Lynn Dan Pham, um, she did a movie called Indochine with Catherine Deneuve. Uh, she's fantastic. And she was also in Jack, o Jack Odiard's uh, The Beat That My Heart Skip. She was a piano teacher. Oh, wow. <coughs> but um, I always was a huge fan of hers. And when we did a Zoom, um, you know, I, I always meant for this part to be for her. Um, she's French. And, and, and I, I asked, uh, you know, biggest thing I want to ask you is, would you be willing to shave your head? And without any sort of reservation, she said, absolutely. It's the, the, the part I feel requires that. So we actually filmed her getting her head shaved, and it was quite emotional. She, she started crying. and um, But, yeah, you know, I think 
you know, I think that all adds. That's what you feel in the the film is those in, in, you know intangibles that that just are a part of it. Um, I'd love to, for you to talk a bit about um, the look of the film in terms of what you shot on, your approach to your shooting style in this film. Um, the colors are incredible. The color palette of the film, there's a, you know, it's very kind of visceral. You're shooting into the sun a lot, into lights. There's a lot of reflections off mirrors and windows. Um, it's like very visually rich. Could you, could you talk about sort of how you created that, what your approach was? Yeah, you know, this film, it, it's about people, right? And it's it, it needs to feel very real and, and um, tangible. So uh, I always wanted to shoot it on 16 millimeter. Um, it was something I fought for from the very, very beginning of the whole process. I kept saying, you know, we're gonna shoot this on 16. We're gonna, and you know, as production goes, they go, hey, let's talk about that 16. And you're like, no, we're shooting this on 16. Hey, if you give up that 16, you can have this extra stunt. I uh, know we're gonna shoot this on 16. So it was something that I had to be really vigilant about. Other, otherwise, in this day and age, that's it's just not possible. Um, but uh, you know, um, this film, I think there's the you know big influences like a lot, of course like Cassavetti's films that feel just real about people and and uh, the approach was very natural lighting. You know, not a lot of barely any lights except for like the you know night exteriors you can't do anything except shoot with lights um so uh and barely even any flags or negs you know it just was uh out of the box so we had to shoot at the right time of day that hence you know that the shots that you're talking about you know during golden hour or you know we had to and we scheduled around where the sun was going to be but also you know new orleans like the weather weather is pretty unpredictable so we it was challenging, but um, that's the approach we felt was going to be the most sort of uh, authentic. It's go it, it looks beautiful. And the, in, in terms of production design, I mean, a lot of your interiors have, they, again, very kind of rich, saturated colors in, in all of your locations. Was that, can you talk sort of about your production team? Yes. Uh, my production designer is uh, a Korean, uh, a lady from South Korea. She worked on my, um, she worked on Miss Purple as well, and in uh, my most recent film, and she's just fantastic. You know, she and we have very deep conversations about what certain textures and and colors do psychologically. So we we really did a deep dive. So um, you know, uh, we really try not to make it so like in your face and and obvious. Uh, make it a little bit more subconscious, but that requires a little bit more planning. Especially with the the natural natural light stuff, you know, you have to uh, you know you have to plan really well. Um, but she's uh, fantastic. We 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 spend a lot of time talking. So Justin, your I now I want to talk about your performance in this film because it's unbelievable and like the fact that you directed this film, and you I mean this is an, uh, this had to have been an incredibly demanding role for you to play. You give it all up right Th throughout the entire film. And I mean, I was, I was watching it again a second time here, and I was like, "Oh my God!" Like, he's directing this film as he's doing it. every scene. You're you're kind of at the limit, you know, emotionally or physically. Um, talk about how you just how, how how do you do that? How do you direct this film while doing that performance? Um, and I know you've acted in in your films before, but this feels like a kind of a new yeah new level. Well, I mean, when you have like a uh partner like Alicia Vikander is not very hard <laughs> you know right. it's like you you do your homework you you do your work you do, do your preparation you show up and then you kind of have to be available and present um, but the truth of the matter is uh, you know as as a director kind of my acting takes a back seat because I need for the actors to feel confident uh, and clear about what they need to do so I need to make sure that they're taken care of before I, I worry about myself, you know, I guess like my performance becomes sort of an afterthought. So because of that, I just have to do more preparation. You know, I just spend a lot more time before the film preparing for my stuff so that when I showed up on the day, I had thought of uh, A, B, C, D, uh, and I wasn't gonna be flustered. Um, yeah, but uh, but in the course of a day, like as uh, are you pretty much staying 
are you going from being in character to popping out looking at the monitor or are you just trusting the dp like let's keep going with this i see what you mean um again it's the preparation so like me and the dps have prepared like in- incredibly meticulously uh, for example, like uh, that 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 sort of handheld one, or where, where me and me and uh, Alicia are having that fight that goes from like the bathroom to the kitchen. Um, we had talked about how we're going to shoot that. Then we bring in Alicia and we kind of talk about what she would change. Um, but once we go, we go because we all know what we're supposed to do. Um, but I, I I see what you mean. Uh, I. Uh, I don't watch playback if I'm acting in it because if there's any doubt, let's just do another take. Mm-hmm. Let's not waste right. time looking at playback. Also, it's on 16, so I didn't, we didn't have the money to to, to buy the extra right. like, uh, you know, playback. You know, get all those accessories. Um, so, uh, I do have to trust my own barometer of my performance. Uh, but you know, it's just like when you're in doubt, just do another take. Right. Um, but I don't know, you know, I, I, I think that from <laughs> so many years of acting class and having to self gauge and, and not having, you know, like I feel like in Hollywood, you know, there are certain people who are afforded that sort of mentoring and I never really got that as an actor. So I've had to kind of, you know, uh, self regulate myself. So I think all that stuff came in handy. One of the things that struck me about Really, all the performances in the film, definitely yours, but but in all the scenes, you there's like a very direct, immediate connection between people on screen, like whether it's you and Alicia, Alicia or you and Jesse, or you and, is it Parker or Palmer? Uh, Parker, Parker. Parker. I mean, there's just this like, you're both very present to each other, and it's captured, it's, it's the most electrifying thing to see on screen is when actors are playing in that way. I mean, you mentioned that, being showing up and being present. And I feel like it's kind of the hallmark of, I, I mean, I see it in your other films too, but it's like so pronounced here. It's really, uh, I, I'm speaking now without, I'm making a comment, not a question, but. Uh, um, yeah. I, you know, I just, I think it's uh, trust. You know, I think gaining the trust of the actors and and making sure that they have everything they need to play and not worry about the ancillary stuff is what allows that type of, uh, play to happen and also um, you know I think that um, ultimately I, I'm not a stickler on anything like I also leave room for them to, to discover things and run with things I'm not like a tyrant where I say it has to be exactly like this so I think that freedom allows them to feel you know you know um, open to, to try anything I think that's where that spontaneity and, and realness and sort of aliveness comes from. Yeah. Um, and then could I, let's talk about the final scene in the airport because that feels like just a tour de force uh, scene that it kind of, you know, it, you keep going to these uh, one more level up in terms of what's playing out in that family and also the way you shoot it. And it, could, could you talk about sort of, did, was that something, did you storyboard that out at all or was that like uh, on the fly or like it feels, I mean, it feels very organic, but also constructed in a way where it's like, it's almost like a, a dance or something, you know, the going down that corridor. Yeah. Uh, that location was extremely, extremely difficult. I was trying to actually shoot at the real New Orleans, you know, airport. They were shutting down their old terminal and opening a new terminal. So I thought like, okay, we'll pro- they'll be probably be able to cater to us because that terminal's not in use. But because it's it's, you know... There's a lot of bureaucracy. We could not manage to get them to approve, so we shot that at a ferry terminal uh, in near the water for cruises. Um, so it, the location changed a, a, a n- number of times. So we had to keep like reimagining like the the, the 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 core of it is the same, but the structure of it, like how to shoot it, kept evolving because of uh, the the location aspect of it. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I once I found that place and we locked it down, I really meticulously planned. Also, you know, another thing is that Sydney, uh, when she shot this, was six years old. So, <laughs> so she, you know, I think that you just you you um, child labor laws. You don't, you know, there's a there's only so much time you have with children on set. So that's a big factor of how you have to shoot. You have to shoot her out. Also, you know, it's an emotional scene. So. 
you know, actors are like thoroughbreds, you know, you can't expect them to be like at a peak emotion uh, for the entire shoot. So it's just like, okay, who, like, you know, we shot it towards the end, so w watching through the, 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 the film, who kind of has, you know, more stamina or whatever, and you kind of have to shot it out in a way that services each actor and what they're capable of. Mm -hmm. So of course, like, it's like shoot Jesse first. Uh, with the child, the first take is going to be the best take, you know, because they're going to be the most raw, the most real, the most honest. So we had to be very strategic about how we shot that to get the maximum sort of, um, you know, emotion. Because, you know, after like an hour or two, she's drained. She's six, you know, like, so you got to give her a break, you know. So, um, yeah, it dictated a lot of how yeah. we shot. It, by the way, has, do you know, has she seen the film? I don't think I don't I don't know if Focus has sent it to her and her family. So tomorrow tomorrow's a premiere. Um, it might be the first day she sees it. Wow. She couldn't come to Cannes because I guess Cannes wasn't allowing children. Like I think because of the whole vaccine thing. Um, so it might be the first time she's going to see it. Um, so a last question. Uh, we were talking before you the, you finished the film a, a while ago, and it, its release was delayed thanks to the pandemic. Can, I'd love for you, just anything you'd want to share about sort of that experience for you as a, as a creative, you know, what has that been like? You, you've been working on this film intensely, you're ready to release it into the world, and then it's just like, you have to sit on it. How, d how did you navigate that, and, and um, sort of what other creative things were you doing at the same time? Yeah, um, so, you know, I, I try not to stay put, so, uh, you know, as this was wrapping up, uh, I signed on to do a TV show. Uh, so that took up the uh, another year, uh, and I just finished a film. Uh, so I was working throughout the whole time. So I didn't think about it too much, because that's that's something I cannot control. Right. Who the hell knew there was going to be a pandemic? You know. Um, so you know, like things always get, you know, sort of uh, complicated. But but. Uh, I, what can you do, you know, and, and, and uh, I would love for this, I would have loved for this film to come out earlier because of the subject matter, um, you know, but uh, I think it worked out because had it come out earlier, it might have not have gotten this type of a release. Um, so ultimately, I, I, I think that um, it worked out for the best. You know, I, I wanted to premiere this at Cannes the previous year, but you know, got canceled. So the fact that we got accepted for this year was an incredible honor. And, um, you know, uh, you know, the fact that it's going to be able to be seen in theaters is a, is a huge deal to me because I shot it on 16. Um, <laughs> if you see it on an iPad, I don't know how much of the grain and the sort of the tactile, um, you know, elements you'd be able to see. Uh, ultimately I'm blessed, man. I'm, I'm blessed and I've been able to stay busy. That's great. Well, Justin, thank you so much for thank being you. here tonight. And thank congrats you. on the film. Thank you. Thank, thank you guys you. for coming out. Yeah, thank you all. Good to yeah. see you.